It's no secret How to Train Your Dragon has a beautiful soundtrack and amazing visuals. Since its release in 2010, there has been no doubt of its long-lasting effects. I, personally, find the music just as enjoyable to listen to outside the movies as inside, so powerful that I can see the scenes right there in front of me. I often listen to them while playing games with my friends, and with such a wide variety of different tones and themes, there's always at least one perfect song for every occasion. But it only struck me late last year. Why was I so enthralled with the music when I could be looking at the visuals? To find out, I put my friend with a grade 5 music certificate in music theory to the challenge of finding every theme, detail, and note that makes up this soundtrack in the first movie. And by challenge, I do mean job. And by job, I do mean he was locked in a very small room and he hasn't seen sunlight in days. Oh no no, dear mutant. You cannot come out yet. Anyway, he succeeded. Here is a list of every motif in How to Train Your Dragon 1 and each occurrence of it. Overall, KLC and I identified 10 light motifs in the soundtrack. Because motifs are not named by composers, it's left up to the community or individuals to come up with their own names. So we used context clues to name them ourselves, and if you've got a problem with our titles, then uh, please submit a formal complaint and KLC will get back to you in 10 to 15 business days. The story of How to Train Your Dragon 1 is about a whole collection of different things, but right at its very core it has three central entities. Hiccup, Dragon, society. But why is Toothless? Yes, I understand your concern, but really the main focus is Hiccup. Toothless becomes much more important in the second and third movies. In the first movie he can be seen as more of a stand-in representation of all dragons, similar in the way that Stoic, Gobba, Astrid, and the rest of the Rise represent different aspects of society. Following the three entities for classifications, four themes belong to Hiccup, four themes belong to society, and two to the dragons. And that's not to say that dragons are less important than the other two though. Let's imagine that there are ten foods given out to three classifications. The foods given to the dragon classification must have an S in it, so pasta and cheese. But under cheese, there are lots of different types. Camembert, cheddar, blue, but at the end of the day, it's all cheese. Now replace the cheese with Toothless's themes. Does that help? Basically, how often your motifs are played is more important than how many you have. Also, this script originally was supposed to be an in-depth analysis of music and its use in a few select scenes, but there was too much. So what was supposed to become the first section literally became the entire script. With that being said, if you'd like the first draft of this script along with all the editing comments which myself and Mutant Cacti left for each other, which was 4,800 words long, it's available on Patreon, as well as a supercard of every occurrence of every theme. But anyways, if you'd like to see that video where we focus in on a few select scenes, let me know and it'll maybe follow after a vid or two about a certain French property. Time to transform! The biggest surprise came from the fact that Hiccup had four themes to back him up. These four, in order of appearance, we've named Opening Theme, Hiccup's Theme, Positive All of This Theme, and Negative All of This Theme. The opening theme is rather self-explanatory. It plays behind Hiccup's narration at the very beginning of the movie, and only appears again at the most important moments. During Down Dragon, it shows itself in a minor key for just a few seconds. Later on in the movie, it becomes a marker of victory and triumph for Hiccup. The contrast this creates means that it almost mocks itself by having the slow and distressing minor version at the beginning, mocking Hiccup's false victory, reflecting the horror of his supposed win of finally achieving his dream. For the majority of Hiccup's early interactions with Toothless, it lays just beneath the surface in minor keys, sowing doubt about Hiccup's previous idea of success, killing dragons. It proceeds to sleep for almost an hour before returning in a major key during the cove, when Hiccup tells Astrid not to inform his father about the nest. This scene is obviously super important, and one of the fundamental building blocks behind their relationship, as Astrid sees Hiccup's inner strength for the first time, and falls in love with him. The next time the opening theme comes up is when Stoic saves Toothless, then soon after to symbolize Hiccup and Toothless's reunion, as well as his father's change of heart and mind. At the end of the movie, it plays for the last time after Hiccup wakes from the battle with the wed- with the wed death? With the Red Gif. <laughs> At the end of the movie, it plays for the last time after Hiccup wakes from the battle with the Red Death to this soft, gentle piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This rounds out the story with the same theme it started with, finishing Hiccup's transformation in a satisfying way, while also communicating how his definition of success has changed from killing dragons to saving them, or most of them at least. 
Hiccup's theme plays in tandem with Toothless's theme at all the important moments. This motif represents the character of Hiccup as Toothless's friend, the part of his identity which is connected to dragons. In conjunction with the opening theme, it plays at the beginning of the movie when Hiccup narrates, and is then only heard much later in the film during See You Tomorrow. To put simply, if Hiccup and Toothless are flying together, his theme is there, usually in combination with Toothless's, so it's no surprise Test Drive also includes it. However, we'll break this down more later. The final time we hear it is as Hiccup narrates the ending, going full circle back to the beginning. Lastly for Hiccup, we have the all of this themes. Until we put in the time to ask ourselves what they truly meant and where they showed up, they'd always been head scratchers. Simply put, Hiccup's defining attribute in movie one is his outsider status, the traits that set him apart from the rest of Viking society, whether it's his physical traits, his inventive spirit and obvious creativity, or his open-mindedness about dragons. The recurring motif of characters gesturing to Hiccup and referring to this you just gestured to all of me. To discuss Hiccup's, for lack of a better word, center, is a clear synecdoche for characters evaluating Hiccup's differentiating qualities over the course of the movie's runtime. Naturally, there are two variations of this theme, the one regarding his positive traits and the second being others' scrutiny of them. The positive submotif is deceptively common and plays like this. And you might recognize it as the motif that plays when Hiccup celebrates after shooting down Toothless. Yes, I hit it! Did anybody see that? When Astrid says, First to ride one, though. So. It also plays in my head whenever I successfully manage to kick my phone against the wall instead of dropping it like a normal person. All in all, that's 14 times. I mean in the movie, not for my thing. And every time, it's when Hiccup's wild, creative and unique way of thinking is being referred to or displayed. It's his lifeblood, the signifier to us as the audience that it's what sets him apart which makes him strong and successful in so many cases. Like me, with my phone kicking skills. Perhaps surprisingly, the negative variant of the all of this motif isn't all that present. Like at all. It goes like this. and is introduced when Gobber says, you guessed it. You need to stop all this. But you just pointed to all of me. The only other time it comes up again is when Hiccup walks into the kill ring, and even then it's barely perceptible. It's clearer if we listen to the actual score. Since it comes up so little, it could be argued it's not a motif at all, but I think I probably missed it a few times. Please don't tell KLC. However, this variation isn't the only theme countering the positive all of this motif. In fact, the negative version of it sounds suspiciously similar to one of the society light motifs, the Vikings theme. Society, like Hiccup, has four themes. Now that really says something about how important he is as a protagonist. <laughs> How often your motifs are played is more important than how many you have. Those four being in order of appearance, Burke's theme, the Vikings theme, Stoic's theme, and Astrid slash the love theme. And here's where I'm gonna blow your mind. Check out how similar Stoic's theme is to the positive version of the all of this theme. The more headed stubborn Viking you ever were. Literally, their themes represent their characters, and as Gober tells Stoic how similar Hiccup is to him, we get a side-by-side -side comparison of the two musical pieces. The Vikings theme is definitely the most common of society's themes, appearing 20 times throughout the movie. It first appears during the opening as we are introduced to, well, the Vikings. Shocker. I know, but it's not the worst. Parents believe a hideous name will- For a while, the Vikings theme is against dragons, typically accompanied by powerful brass and vocals to convey a sense of fortitude, resoluteness, and might. All aspects shared with Stoic's theme, a comparatively rare but equally, if not more, resplendent motif. Stoic's theme actually only plays twice, once when he is introduced and again after Hiccup and the gang arrive to fight the Red Death. It also plays when I successfully shatter my mobile device. Similarly to Stoic's theme, the Vikings theme is converted to be more reminiscent of Hiccup's by the end of the movie. Over time, it goes from playing over Stoic planning to kill dragons, to Hiccup and Astrid going back to save Toothless, and also when Hiccup and Toothless fight the Red Death as their village cheers them on. The Vikings theme goes through the same journey that the actual people it represents do. It comes as no surprise that the love theme or Astrid's theme is very well known after her dazzling introduction from Hiccup. And... Astrid... I'm hoping you can guess where this theme comes up, but it's really given time to shine in Romantic Fly and during both kiss scenes. The love theme shows up during romantic scenes, but doubles as Astrid's leitmotif because she's the main love interest, and not just for Hiccup. At the beginning of the movie, Astrid is fully incorporated into Burke's War with Dragons. Any screen time she had mostly involved the Vikings theme in the background. This time for sure is just Burke's theme, and Astrid goes for a spin is, I'm not kidding, the exact same.
And lastly, there's not much else because it just does what it needs to do with ease. It's simple and it doesn't need fancy tricks to be good. It remains consistent throughout the movie trilogy and really, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 10 out of 10 for execution. Another example of a simple theme done well is Burke's theme. Burke's theme is the same as the Vikings theme. They only have very minor differences and are essentially two different versions of the same theme. I've separated them only because they're very specific in their variation and Burke's theme and the Vikings theme are very consistently different, even if not by a lot. Burke's theme is very generally used for high energy scenes like the aforementioned Astrid bits. When the Vikings and Burke's themes are played together, the Vikings themes is almost always played a perfect fifth down from Burke's theme, which makes it feel darker and more serious in comparison to its more light-hearted counterpart. Burke's theme kind of grounds the movie and keeps it from feeling too dark all of the time, and while it remains vital to making the movie enjoyable, it doesn't play as big of a role in the story. That leaves us with two dragon themes. Again though, don't put too much importance on the number of sub-themes there are. Remember the thing with all the cheese and whatever the hell KLC was talking about? Yeah, the number of times a theme occurs is a much better representation of significance than how many there are. These themes have so many variations it's difficult to cleanly define one from the other. To begin with, there are two sides to the dragon themes, Toothless's theme and the Red Deaths, the latter of which is incredibly important in this movie since it's the motif we associate with the main antagonist. Not that it's quite that simple because, well, Hiccup is the protagonist, Toothless and Astrid are support, Stoic is heavy, I, I mean the anti-hero, and the Red Death is the actual villain. So with that being the case, we need a theme to fit her. The dragon's under her control, and any moment in which the dragons are being negatively interpreted. The Red Death theme crops up a total of 10 times before it's never heard again for obvious reasons. It starts off very strong with this absolute unit of a trombone, and the theme continues as Hiccup informs the audience about the status killing each dragon hold. Originally, before the Red Death is realized as the dragon controlling the others, the theme targets the ones raiding the village. Strangely enough, the next time we hear it is after Hiccup come come home, mama. The next time we hear it is after Hiccup comes home from saving Toothless as Stoic prods the fire, readying for the expedition to Helheim's gate. My interpretation is that Stoic's hatred of dragons is interfering with his relationship with Hiccup, and this is partly backed up by how eerily similar the Red Death's theme and Viking's theme are. They're notably different, but behind all the other sounds and distractions. <laughs> What the fuck? I mistook them for each other multiple times and had to go back and listen repeatedly to be sure of which was being played when. This is especially the case because they tend to show up in situations seemingly unrelated to what they represent. The scene just mentioned, for example. The Red Death's theme comes up surprisingly often in scenes completely devoid of dragons, and similar for the Vikings theme playing in weird situations. As mentioned earlier, the Vikings theme is very common, but very much stops appearing towards the end. In fact, I considered calling it the Negative Burks theme because it refers almost exclusively to moments when Vikings are killing or planning to kill dragons, even when Hiccup is getting ready to kill Toothless, and during Ready the Ships, very explicitly as they're about to go invade the dog, you fuck, and during Ready the Ships, very explicitly as they're about to go invade the dragon's nest. On the complete flip side is Toothless's theme. I've saved this for last because of how incredibly versatile and common it is, and also just because there's so much to talk about. While Hiccup's myriad motifs represent a number of different aspects of his character, Toothless's theme is first introduced when Hiccup is trying to kill him with a minor key. Not Hiccup is trying to kill him with a small metal object, the key of the music is minor. It really lingers as Hiccup watches Toothless, and as an introduction, it's very simply letting the audience know, hey, hey, Dragon's got feelings, okay? That fear Hiccup talks about later on, saying Toothless was just as scared as him as he was of Toothless, that's mostly achieved by Toothless's theme coming up so sad and lonely the first time we and Hiccup get a real look at Toothless. After Hiccup cuts him loose, we hear Toothless's theme again, still in a minor key, but this time terrifying. We go from scared to scary in the span of a minute, and at this point we are very much getting a parallel from just before when Hiccup spared Toothless. It's very important that now, as Toothless is about to spare Hiccup, we get the exact same motif to link the two events. At that point in the movie, Toothless's theme is mostly associated with his relationship with Hiccup, and that doesn't go away, but it does evolve over time to represent more than just that. This is especially for when Hiccup's theme comes up during flying sequences and See You Tomorrow, reinforcing their bond with each other. Unsurprisingly, the next time we hear Toothless's theme is on the Night Fury page of the Dragon Book sequence. This builds a connection in the audience's mind to associate a particular character with a certain piece of music, solidifying them together as one. There's, of course, the added nuance of Hiccup showing us that he he knows more about Toothless than anyone else, I mean, obviously, but Night Furious as a whole, and how that relationship is being defined within his Viking society, a forbidden friendship if you will. I am funny, but please subscribe. Right, please. Toothless's theme naturally plays over this section, but not alongside Hiccups because their relationship hasn't developed far enough for that yet. Although if you listen really closely, you can just hear the first four notes of the positive all of this theme playing as he puts down his sketchbook.
During forbidden friendship, the ostinato we during forbidden friendship, the ostinato we hear during forbidden. <laughs> I, I cannot speak normally after God. During forbidden friendship, the ostinato we hear throughout the scene is a slightly shuffled phrase taken directly from Toothless's theme. From this point forward, just about every time Toothless's theme comes up is whenever Toothless and Hiccup are doing something together. During See You Tomorrow, when Hiccup is putting Toothless's saddle on, we get a magical few seconds of Toothless's theme mixed in with the opening theme playing on top of it. and then Test Drive. Test Drive is a god-tier piece of thematic writing, and if you're interested further, I would 100% recommend this video from James Cornell where he dives much further into it, and with just a tad bit more expertise. So since that video does exist, I won't cover in too much detail here, but it's at this point that these two really almost become one. From here on out, their themes almost always play side by side, such as in one of the best moments musically in the whole film. and this incredible amount of tension gets released. Then, get this, in the next eight minutes, it comes up seven more times. Because not only does it represent Toothless, but Toothless and Hiccup's relationship, and also dragons as a whole. It's the antithesis to the Red Deaths theme. It's the reason behind why we get this. This scene confused me for a very long time. I thought it was a shuffle Toothless's theme. Then I thought it was a really weird version. Then I thought it was version. a combo. Then, like, then I thought it was weird. However, after a lot of listening, I realized that it was actually just Hiccup's theme. A few phrases in. It made me realize just how similar Toothless's theme is to the specific part in Hiccup's theme, that I'd literally confused them for each other. The fact that John Powell wrote Hiccup and Toothless's main themes to be so similar, and yet so recognizably different, even though these two parts of them are never played together, never compared, and most people wouldn't even consciously realize this was the case is pretty incredible. I know we've said it many times, but John Powell is such a great composer. Of all the people working on it, he definitely shaped the franchise as much as anyone else, and his mark on the series as a whole and on everybody who's watched it will last a very long time. So is the music actually any good? Well, I don't know, maybe. If you've paid attention, hopefully you'll know the answer is a relatively solid yes, insanely so. Hopefully we've passed on some new knowledge to you, and now you'll have a greater appreciation for the amount of amazing work put into the soundtrack when you inevitably watch the movie again. In total, there's 116 instances of themes coming up, which when the runtime is only 89 minutes means we get more than one a minute. This soundtrack is dense, and How to Train Your Dragon wouldn't be the same without it. I'd like to thank my friend Mutant Cacti for volunteering hours of his time to help with this video. If you enjoyed, please do consider leaving a like and subscribing, and maybe telling me what you'd like to see next. Also, Patreon credits! How cool! Look at that! Your name could be here! Nonetheless, thank you so, so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Play.